My name is Bob Scheffler. I'm president of the Canadian Public Library District Board of Trustees. And I want to thank you for coming to our meeting tonight. This is the first of three workshops related to the uh, new Geneva Public Library. Before we get into the meeting, I'd like to make some other uh, some introductions. Other board members that are here this evening include Zachary Kraft, Dana Hintz, Pat Lord, Paul Conorado, and Mark Adams. Uh, also, Christine Lazarus, our library director, who uh, many of you already know. From Studio GC, we have uh, Craig Meadows and Rick McCarthy. And then our speaker tonight is Michael Mackey. Uh, Michael is a retired architect who lives in St. Charles with extensive library design experience. So he'll be giving the majority of the presentation this evening. I'd like to thank everyone for their support during the referendum. Uh, prior to the referendum, we were working on the schematic design phase. Now that allowed us to come up with preliminary floor plans so that we could do cost estimates and uh, building size estimates. Also did some exterior and interior visuals to help show what the spaces might look like. At this point, we're moving into the detailed design phase. Uh, the design work will proceed in an iterative manner over the next several months, and we thank you for participating in this series of workshops, which will help provide input for that detailed design work. Tonight, uh, discussion will focus on architecture and on the history of libraries of the architectural form, including how they have changed over time. As such, we're talking at a high level this evening and we'll get into more dis uh, detailed discussions in workshops two and three. There's a, a couple things that uh, areas where we're looking for your thoughts and we'll be gathering your input later this evening. First, what should the library or any new structure in the Geneva downtown area uh, represent relative to Geneva's past and future? Secondly, what factors should the architects consider that are important to you? So keep those in mind. There's one other uh, point that I'd like to make, and that is we're not designing this library for the year 2019. In all likelihood, this building will still be in use as we approach the end of the century in the 2090s. Uh, architecture as such, at that point in time, it will be a historic structure because of its age, regardless of what form it takes at this point. Uh, since architecture evolves over time, both as it has in the past and will in the future, what form should the library take as a future historic building in Geneva? So those are just some thoughts to keep in mind, help frame your thoughts as uh, we listen to Michael's presentation and then gather your input later this evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Mackey. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all for coming, it's a beautiful night. I know you probably realize that, so thank you. Appreciate your time being here. So a couple of things that we want to talk about today are the critical components in architecture in terms of judging architecture. Uh, a series of timelines that are going to coordinate history of architecture with technology um, and, and how we live. And then uh, a little bit about general library history. So the, the, the real goal of these three meetings is to determine community aspirations. So if at any time during this meeting you uh, find yourself drifting, think about aspirations and, and write them down because those are really the things we want to hear at the end of this, at the end of this uh, presentation. We also want to give you some background information both on architecture and as Bob said, the history of, of libraries. And so we're really after input from the public at this stage. The, exterior of the building has not been developed, so if you're here to look at that and to critique that, you're going to have to wait really to the third meeting for, for that session. And this is also an opportunity for the library board, the staff, and, and, and the architects um, to hear um, your comments. So who am I? That's not a uh, existential <laughs> question or anything like that. Um, I retired in, in November uh, after about 20 I wrote 25, I think it's 27 years, as a designer and a project manager uh, in architectural firms. Um, probably the last 17 years, 18 years, were spent designing public libraries in the Chicagoland area. 
there's a list of some of them. Um, probably the two closest ones were the major renovation in addition to Wheaton, and then um, recently the uh, academic library up at OGT. Um, so I'll just take a moment. The project in Flossmoor that I, I, I designed, if anybody, people are familiar, it's a, it's a suburb uh, in south of Chicago. We have Addison Public Library, um, which is on a, a community uh, sort of campus with the Village Hall. And then these are some renderings and an interior shot of Elgin Community. So, you know, what a lot of architects would tell you is, well, this is from my early period, my middle period, and my late period. <laughs> well, I, I can't stand up here and say that with a straight face. The reality is that all architecture is situational. It's a response to a really unique set of circumstances. <coughs> that has to do with the site, of where the building is going to be, the need if it's a public library, uh, those relationships, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. The technology available at the time, and then the aspirations. And those aspirations are usually of the client, the architect, and in this case, because this is a public building, of the community. And so that's really sort of what we're going to have to focus on. And the architect, you know, really needs to remain open to all of these influences in order to come up with a solution or a design that answers those. So, as I say here, public buildings sometimes offer an opportunity to participate in the design, sometimes they don't. And this one is, this is one of those times that you can participate. So, where are we in terms of the process? So the library has gone through a series of um, steps before they, before the successful referendum, in determining that the current library cannot meet the mission that they have set for themselves. And so, with the passing of the successful referendum, we are here at this point trying to gather um, some uh, input from the, the public. Eventually, once the design is, is finished, it will go to the, uh, to the city for approvals uh, in, in, in front of a series of commissions. Once the building is finally approved, they will then go out to bid um, to contractors and, and construction uh, will start after that. So I'm going to go sort of way back and give people a sort of a foundation of how you judge architecture. So you can see this very serious guy here is Vitruvius. And he was, he was alive um, before, the, before the common era. He, he was working for Julius Caesar uh, as an engineer and an architect. And he wrote a series, of, a treatise basically, on architecture. It's called the Ten Books of Architecture. Every, every architectural student you know, is aware of this. You get that, I got that book, and a series of other ones. Um, but he, in the book, he talks about three things as being the, the, the way that you, uh, the fundamental virtues uh, that you have, to, you have to meet in order for it to be architecture. So he said utilitas, whoops, sorry, utilitas, fermitas, and venustas, which really translate English, we always use commodity, firmness, and delight. And those are the three, and I'll talk about these in, in a moment. So commodity, what is commodity? Commodity really refers to the fact that, you know, does the building work? You know, you've designed it, um, all the interior parts, the relationship of rooms to one another, are they big enough? Does it really work? It's the commodity. So there's a correct hierarchy of spaces and relationships. And this is typically done, you know, with the client and the architect. In this case, a lot of this has been worked out with the, um, the staff of the library the next one is firmitas, firmness, you know, soundness. It basically, you know, is the building strong enough? Now, in Vitruvius's time, that really referred to the, the primarily to the structure. As we come into a modern era, the era there are all sorts of other things that laid upon that. We've got a mechanical system. We've got um, the building envelope. Is it durable? Is it strong? Does it keep the water out? Does it keep the heat in? Those sorts of things. So firmness is the second virtue. The last one is the nustas, the light, beauty, 
probably the most difficult one um, to handle, and that's probably why we're here today. So at the end of this, people are going to be looking at the building and thinking, is this beautiful? Do I like this? So this is sort of you know the, the whole issue of beauty being up in the eye of the beholder. How do we judge that? Especially as times change, does beauty change as well? Well, Vitruvius thought about that, and he, he said that the human body should be the judge, and we should work on proportion, geometry, um, in order to, to, to define beauty. And so people are probably familiar with uh, Vitruvian man, this image by Leonardo da Vinci. And just to show you that, that uh, beauty is uh, related to uh, the current fashion, you know, here's a back piece, a tattoo back piece of Vitruvius on someone's back. <laughs> so we see in the Renaissance, we see throughout, you know, architectural history, this sort of going back, this looking at buildings um, uh, through proportion and through geometry, um, even to the, you know, the, the layout of the church plan. Somebody's gone back and taken a look at why Mona Lisa, besides her smile, might be so appealing. To, to us, and it's based on this geometric form. So proportion uh, becomes really important. So these are the three um, components that architects will look at continually in the process of designing a building. So, you know, is it beautiful? Yes, it's beautiful, but it doesn't work. We got a problem. Is it, you know, will it stand up? Yes, it will stand up. Is it, uh, does it meet all the requirements of the planning? Yes, but not very good looking. That's a problem. So, is it architecture? So, here we have up on the on the top area here a storage facility. My daughter just moved back, and I'm helping her move stuff up the storage. So this is on my mind. <coughs> so we see, oh yeah, that, that seems to work. Everybody wants a small space and that sort of thing. So, and then we look at the section, um, and you know, it's not the greatest structural system in the world, but it'll last for the X number of years that the, the storage facility will be there. But when we go down to the facade at the bottom here, uh, is there anybody here who would say that's beautiful or that meets your standard for architecture? So, no, it doesn't pass. So, the next one, um, this is a project, uh, people may be familiar with this, uh, in Sydney, the Sydney Opera House by Jörn Lipson. Um, the plan, you know, is a, is a well-functioning plan. There's a couple of um, halls, there's a nice plaza outside of it. Um, structurally, you know, very advanced. I think they had to um, design a new way to cast the concrete for this project. It's very advanced. Um, and the elevation you see down below is, is very iconic. I think people would agree that, that this, is a, this is a very nice building. Um, there are some questions. It was a little over, uh, construction took about 10 years longer than they thought. <laughs> and uh, there were some cost overruns as well. But here's something close to the home. This is uh, the Pritzker Pavilion by Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry is, you know, a world-renowned architect at this point in his career. Um, and we, we take a look at the, you know, the plan and people and people been down there. It works wonderfully. We've got the beam of the big fountain. Um, just, a, just a great sort of space. How about section? Does it function, firmness? Well, I'm pretty sure it's not going anywhere, so structurally it's fine. But one of the things that, about having an outdoor venue that a lot of people don't take into account is the sound. You know, you typically go to an outdoor venue, they put up some speakers, and the sound is not very good. Well, Gary's thought about that. And we take a look here in this section, and we can see them here where they've hung speakers on this trellis. And if anybody has been there for a concert, the sound is actually very good. It's really nice. And so we take a look again now at the, at the elevation. Um, and some people might say, well, I'm not really quite sure what's going on there. Um, personally, I think that the, the juxtaposition of these forms against the, the, the skyline or the, the, the vertical elements in Chicago is quite nice. I've been there for a concert, and as the, as the it gets darker, 
they get very gray, and the heat from the wood paneling on the stage really captures your vision, and it's a, it's a very nice space. So I don't know if any pe people have been there, if you have differing opinions, um, maybe you could let me know. Okay, so do people understand the components, and do they agree that these are legitimate ways of judging architecture? Anybody have ideas that other things that we should be including here that may not be part of one of those? Okay. People think there is an ideal beauty, or well, that beauty changes with time. What do, you, what, what do you mean by that? Everyone has their own their own concept, opinion, right? Which you, of course, are you are familiar with, but you will find out the same thing is true in Geneva. Mm -hmm. Everybody will have their own concept. Sure, sure. sure. Anybody else? Any ideas? So the question, you know, are commodity and firmness also subject to fashion and preference? And I think, I think they are. Um, uh, especially commodity. There's one other uh, element that you mentioned that it's in the, but that budget. And right. A budget is a constraint as to how <clears throat> much you can spend toward each of those uh, three components. Correct, correct. And I had that on an earlier slide, and I, I, I sort of... Well, we know what our budget is. Yeah, we know what our budget is. <laughs> and really, I, I sort of put that in the idea of the commodity. Yeah. That you can't, you know, you can't design something that you can't afford. Okay. On the other hand, it can be an inspiration. The constraints, for instance, that faced Frank Lloyd Wright in building Unity Temple mm -hmm. meant that he used uh, a very uh, a new concept right. in material and in design, right. and he came up with something that was totally new and wonderful. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. On to that topic, we'll be talking about something like that a little later too today. In addition to beauty, I think we also need to think about function and accessibility. Um, given that look around the age of the, the room sure. here, many of us may have physical uh, challenges, mm -hmm. uh, visual challenges, and and to go beyond just the mere um, minimum for say ADA compliance, but think about universal design right. from a physical standpoint. And mm -hmm. as things go on later, I'll talk about information technology and things as needed. <coughs> but right now, thinking about it as as a way that would be a Branding and uh, a good PR thing to do, plus be more accessible to, to people, okay. you know, a greater okay. number of people. Right, right. And as we know, all public buildings need to be accessible. You're talking about going a step beyond yes. that. Right. right, any other comments? Uh, context, how does context play into you know, popping a building in uh, a residential neighborhood versus an urban industrial? Right, and I, you know we will eventually be talking about that, but I think that, that is is part and parcel with beauty. That you can't you can't do something that is so different or so strange that you know you're you're left wondering why that sort of thing. But sure, context is important, and especially um, in the next session we'll be talking about the site, especially. Okay. Okay. Oh, can you identify this Lego character from the Lego movie, the recent Lego movie? Yes, it's Vitruvius. <laughs> Still relevant after all these years. <laughs> so it, it's funny when you go and you find out on the internet. I was looking up Vitruvius and a whole section of Vitruvius tattoos. Vitruvius, the Lego character. As well. So a little bit about timelines and form. Architecture, obviously, we're going to be concerned about form. And I, I, in some ways, I'm going to have to apologize for this next slide. But this is, this is where my thinking, and uh, having studied anthropology um, as a, uh, an undergraduate, sort of comes into play, right, where I can't just think about the building without thinking about what else is going on in the world and in society at the same time. And so, when I started to put this together, I, oh, sorry. I looked at basically, you know, the, the sort of architectural, and you can see the change in form here, but it wasn't really telling the whole story. And I added the section here on, on structural systems, which really lend uh, to the form. 
that didn't t tell it all for me, so I went back and I looked at the ages, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, as we see, sort of running across the top here. Industrial Age, and the age we're in now, the Bio, Info, Cogno, Nano, <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful. It's not quite as easy as the Iron Age, but maybe we can, we can shorten that and just call it the, the in Information Age. So at the same time, we see that the change in, you know, the way in people occupy uh, the earth. We, we go from villages to, to walled cities, and we eventually end up here with nation states. And here we see, you know, the, the mega city. Now, of course, we're talking about Western architecture, but I was reading an article just the other day about uh, a city in China, 11 million people. I've never heard of this, this city, and, and I think that we're seeing that more and more often around the world. The population is swelling into these very, very large cities. Now, obviously not everybody lives in a mega city, but that is where the popu population is, uh, is centered. And so what we also see here is the, the, the transfer of information and knowledge in this line here. So it starts out as an oral tradition. We go into an area of time in history where pictograms, hieroglyphics are being used. Those, those trans, transform into you know, the, the development of an alphabet, especially we see that in you know, sort of the Greek alphabet at this point. See people starting to write books, collection of books. Um, right here we have the printing press of 1440, which I think is both an important point in libraries and also in architecture, and I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, but I think we could probably agree that computers are, are really um, a predominant uh, vehicle for transferring information, storing information, and, and basically, uh, you know, critical at this point uh, in, a, in our society. So, all that said, as, as I said, I wanted to apologize for this slide, but we see, we see the development of architecture um, from Egyptian architecture, we all know the pyramids, but they were also building basically on a trabeated system, which is a simple uh, post and lintel system. And that was true for the Greeks as well, um, in, in terms of their building. Refining proportion for the Greeks, they, they did a lot of things to push um, design and building forward. Um, when the Romans start to pick up all the Greek architecture. They also very ingenious, and I said lots of engineers, Vitruvius was an engineer, they developed the arch. And this changed things dramatically because now you could span greater distances than you could with a post in view because of the stone doesn't have to be as, as thick. Um, but what you can also do, as you see in this, is you can use smaller and smaller bits because you have the development of what's called the keystone where when, the, when things fit into the, the arch and the keystone is put in, it's not going anywhere. Basically, you can span the long distances. So that really becomes the architecture of the, one of the drivers for form for many, many years. And we see that the Roman period turns into the Romanesque, so it's very, it's still basically Roman architecture. And then as, as architecture wanted to um, uh, go up, the church, church architecture, as we see here, um, the development of a special arch was needed. And around 800, um, Islamic architecture, they invented the pointed arch. And that came into Western architecture in the form of the, um, sort of the Gothic cathedral. Now, in this, what happens is you have the pointed arch, but the arch cannot be sustained the, the, the thrust is so great that you have the development of what's called the flying buttress. And people have probably heard that term before. Um, and the flying buttress basically is an exoskeleton for the building. So now we've taken the structure sort of out of the building and, and put it outside um, in order to maintain or attain that height of the building. So during the modern, modern era, um, we start to see buildings like this built with on a structural frame, whether it's steel or concrete, but the frame is really the, the, the primary structural system. And then 
as we go, come in here to what we are in now, called neo-modern or parametricism in terms of design. And, and really what this is, is for, for, for a long time, the, the, the design of buildings, you know, based on a, a grid system, but also the, um, the fact that architects would prepare the drawings, the engineers would prepare drawings, those drawings would go to a contractor, the, those drawings would come from the contractor to the fabricator, the fabricator would, would fabricate it, it would go out, it would be erected, it's a long process. What's been happening recently is the ability for the computers um, to speak to one another in terms of going from idea through fabrication and form. And so the, the ability to achieve um, shapes, forms, uh, it has, has really expanded. Now, this type of architecture is probably not on the horizon here um, for a while, but it's coming. It's coming, you know, in the future this will be, this will be pretty common. So what I wanted to do is go back for a moment to this time right here, 1440. That's the invention of the printing press. So Victor Hugo, and people might know the book, Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, writing in 1830, I think it was when it, yeah, 31, it came out. His character, Frollo, um, the archdeacon, has some people into his office, and he, 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 says, he says to them, this will kill that. The book will kill the edifice. And it's kind of a, a prophetic statement. Well, it's prophetic in some ways because um, Victor Hugo was writing in, in 1830 about something set in, in the 1400s. But what does he mean? So for centuries, generations basically wrote the story of their culture in the buildings. So we see that in statue, statuary, we see that in carved stuff, you know, um, relief. We see it in, uh, we see that in stained glass, we see it in gargoyles. This is a communication of the, the culture to a basically illiterate people. So the buildings really told the story of, you know, your place in the universe. And he's saying that we don't need that anymore. He says, small things overcome great ones. The book will kill the building. So <laughs> it's a pretty heavy statement, especially for a guy who is trying to save these monuments. So um, interesting, you know, you, you take a look here, you see how these are, all of the entryways to Notre Dame are encrusted with saints and stories and that sort of thing, and basically waiting for the day where the book takes it. So at the same time, this is sort of the modern era, um, we're looking at a, a, a growing population and people who are you know, inventing things and move, trying to move forward. Um, but we see buildings, so we see buildings taking on a new role. Um, we're, we're moving away from just having the fire you know, to more complex um, mechanical systems that will allow people to um, be <coughs> happy, healthy, warm, cool, um, all year, all day. And so that has an impact. Thermal comfort and, and, and heating and cooling has an impact on the form of the building. And we also see all these this additional technology and requirements placed on the building. So this is just a little cutaway of some of those things. In addition, we have this expansion of building types but we are still, as you see, left with our uh, three, three virtues. But I think what's happened here in modern architecture is we have a change of focus and a reallocation of resources to the systems in the building. But jumping ahead a little bit here, Le Corbusier, a, an architect in Europe, and the reason why I want to talk about him is he started talking about design in the, in the machine age, which is in the, the 30s, between 1900 and 45, really, he's working and, and uh, uh, 
both as a, a planner, as an architect, and writing as well. You can see this is one of his projects. It's a, uh, a residence in the Villa Bois. And uh, you can see that he's still going back and using proportion, much like the Tru Vitruvius recommended on his building. So it's modern, but you know, really taking those things into account. He writes a book called Towards an Architecture, Towards a New Architecture. Um, so sort of not necessarily updating the Vitruvius, but having a new look. We're in the machine age. We need to start talking about how we design in the machine age. Um, I like this. This is not the original cover, but I like this. You know, we have this very hot, fancy car sort of rolling past a, uh, a uh, an ancient ruin and here and sort of talking about his, his, his new idea. So he also, um, you know, as I said, looking back to Vitruvius, updated Vitruvian man to the modular man. And at this point, industrialization is happening. And so the idea of uh, uh, standardizing materials, standardizing sizes, bringing the metric system in, um, he tries to take that all into account with his, with his work on the modular. So he comes up with five points in terms of architecture columns, and as you see in this little, this little diagram here, these are the columns that now support the floor slab rather than walls. So as soon as you do that, you have an opportunity to have what's called a free plan or an open plan. So the plans no longer have to relate floor to floor because they're not carrying the next floor. The, the walls are not carrying the next floor, the columns are. So talk about a free facade. Similarly, on the outside of the building, out here, um, it could be anything you want it to be. It can be brick, it can be glass, it can be stucco, because again, you're not relying on that to carry the floors above. Ribbon windows, and I think you can see that here. What he's really talking about is the fact that you can now have an expanse. Um, you don't have to worry about lintels because, the, again, the, the walls are not bearing. And the roof terrace. Now, at the time that he was writing this, uh, I think that the development of materials to allow the, uh, a flat roof were, were, were getting better and better. And for a long time, I think that this, this roof terrace idea was, you know, everybody was you know, not too sure about it. But now, you know, with green architecture, we really see that coming back into play where we're talking about green roofs, we're talking about roof gardens, a whole series of things. So in essence, you know, writing in the 30s, he has predicted so many things about how we build today. So at the same time, and when you're in America, I guess you, you need to talk about Frank Lloyd Wright at some point. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright is working. I have a series of plans here for residences residences that he did. One is his own, and I don't know if anybody's been to any of these projects, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Home Studio in Oak Park um, is here. So this north part of the plan was built in 1889 when he, when he first went to Oak Park. And you can see that that's this part of the building here. You can see that it's fairly Victorian, you, what you would expect at that time in history. It's uh, pretty modest in terms of the, the layout of the rooms. You have to remember there's the central part, which is so key to write. You also have to remember lots of homes didn't have central heating at that time. You know, the, the, the house would get very small in the winter time because everybody would be around the fireplace and the rooms would get closed off. So essentially you needed individual rooms in order to keep the, the middle of the house warm. But then he adds on his studio in 1898. He's pretty successful now, and he's doing well, so he builds, he builds his uh, studio. So we can see that the forms in plan are not all that different than what's going on here. But we do begin to see that his exterior expression is quite different than, than the home, home in the back. And so it might, I think, just because it's commercial, but I think he's starting to explore uh, a, a, different, a different vocabulary. So if we come down to 1909, basically 20 years 
later he he's working. This is the um, the Roby House, right? In, in, it's a nice nice place to go and visit as well. Um, you can see that he is really sort of trying to get rid of this Victorian box, these series of boxes. He's he's you know expressing the horizontal uh, in terms of the prairie and the the profound importance on materials in his work. As a matter of fact, Henry uh, Hitchcock uh, wrote, I think, one of the first monographs on his work, and it was called In the Nature of Materials, because of this, this, this really compelling uh, use of materials. But you can see here, here is the central sort of park and stair, but these rooms have been opened up to just flow right into one another, and you no longer have the, the boxy nature. And then by, by 36, you know, again, another 20 some odd years, 30 years, um, he, he, has, he does the, the house at uh, Falling Water, the Calvin House. And you can see the change in terms of how a plan um, looks. In architecture, the black, we call the poche of the plan. And what that does is it often it describes the space up uh, here. See how dark that is. The light parts are window. But when you look down at this plan, you see that these are just just lines in the you know in the landscape sort of there or in the in the, the waterfall. And so what he's really done is he's really um, what I think is distilled the American spirit in this building. And what that is is rooted by the hearth, by the family. That was very important to. to to write in terms of his domestic architecture. So rooted, scanning the horizon, being able to look out clearly through, and ready for exploration. And I say that because if you look at if you look at the difference between this building and this building, I mean you're, you're waiting for something to shoot out of there. You are really, you know, it looks like it's ready to take off. It's really a pretty, pretty remarkable uh, piece of work. So So Wright, you know, championed what he called organic architecture. And the idea is that a building is a product of its time and place, intimately connected to a particular moment and site, never the result of an imposed style. And so that's why we see in Wright's work, we see the uh, Jacob's house in, in, uh, in Wisconsin, and we see the Guggenheim in New York. Talk about a, a you know, a, a incredibly different aesthetic. But what was he a master of? I think he was a master really of having a flexible mind and being able to grasp the really important things in each project and then bringing them to life in a new way and in a novel way. And so, as I say here, you know, unite, unique site context, the need of the program and the aspirations. And the aspirations are really important. So, to seize this moment in time, what values should the library architecture communicate, both to members of the community and to the rest of the world? The library should be inviting. Inviting. It should be easy to get into as well. Right. What, what, what kinds of things make it welcoming, do you think? Um, open, uh, well, I don't want to this. Um, <coughs> entryways are not hidden. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can right. easily find out how to Right. And they're, they're spacious, there's room. Easy access and yeah. spaciousness. Yeah. Generally, the architecture is very connected with its history. Mm -hmm. And with the architecture, some of which goes back to the 1850s. And this building, of course, is going to be in the Geneva Historic District. But at the same time, this is 2017, and you can't really recreate history. Mm -hmm. But something in the area of paying homage 
what Geneva has been and where it has come in a new building. Mm -hmm. So, okay, no, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. Do you think? Do, do, I'm, I'm, one more. Do you think that do you, are there things that you think about that could pay off? Well, I think of the Carnegie Libraries mm -hmm. because this is the Carnegie Library right. that we are in. Right. Um, <clears throat> there was a lecture that Preservation Partners held uh, last winter in the day of. Uh, architectural group, young man from uh, where was he, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they've been doing a great deal of work in old cities, building in a way that doesn't mimic the old but complements it. Mm -hmm. I'm not an artist or an architecture okay. or an architect, and I can't really describe it. But they showed several projects that were obviously new mm -hmm. and obviously fit right into an old, old area. And yeah. there, are, there, are, there are some ways that you do that with materials, mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of things. So uh -huh. materials. But they weren't glaring. Right. He, that's what he showed examples. Okay. Of. There were some motels or different things, and then some were just like, <clears throat> you know, and then others. Of course, that fits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So materials, shapes, it would be kind of harmonious. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean it's the same, doesn't mean it's exact, no. but it works. It, it doesn't works. scream at you, it, it works quick. It complements the area. Gotcha. It feels natural. Mm -hmm. Long term. Harmonious is good. I think that uh, to bow to what Colin is saying of relating to the history of this town, I think the exterior surface material could be the river stone that is seen in some of the earliest structures. The building could be very, Joe Spears if you want, the building could be very contemporary, acknowledging this is being built in 2017, mm -hmm. but if an exterior surface such as the Niagara Dolomite that we see in the earliest structures was, was used, it would say, we're coming from the same place, right. although we're coming from it now, Right. And then in hand with that, going a bit further, and you see it all through every single slide of yours, there is a harmonious quality to each period. So if the only exterior right. surface is stone, it's only stone. It's not red and concrete and stone and something else. So you're talking about continuity of design for the exterior? No, I'm, I'm talking about by using a material that is so frequently seen by the oldest structures, okay. like stone, okay. we're showing we come from the same place, right. but we're building this Got in you. 2008. Okay. Okay. Yep. And that, that's a good point, so I'm going to write a note down, but we'll talk about that as kind of like a mechanism in our next kind of conversation on part two about how did things like that help satisfy some of these right. kind of discussion points of how do you achieve harmony, right. as it were. But I'll, I'll make a note of that of materiality is important. Right. Yes? When this building was built, mm -hmm. it was an avant-garde structure. Mm -hmm. All the Carnegie libraries were classical in style. Right. And here's Geneva, and we have an arts and crafts building which is really um, the latest. Right. It's, okay. it was, it's not unique or uh, particularly original, okay. but it said this is a forward-looking group okay. and the library does not look dated. Okay. Right. And I would like our building to represent that kind of forward-looking uh, spirit okay. that, um, that I think too many people think that to fit in, it um, you can pay homage, but there are various ways of paying homage which are quite different. For instance, in the middle of Vienna, you have the St. Stephen's <laughs> Cathedral, and then you have a reflective glass building that's very tall, really next to it, which reflects that mm -hmm. and says, wow. Right. 
So, right. you know, yeah. I think there are various ways of, of doing that. Right. And right. I would like to be on the on the forward looking side. Okay, okay. That's that's a good comment. Forward looking. Other people come? Yeah. I think one of the things that uh, people like about Geneva, particularly the downtown, is that it's walkable. You stroll through Geneva, you see okay. those kind of things. It's not the Randall Road corridor where you have your parking lot in right. front and your buildings in the back. So I'd like to keep that right. in this design. Right. Still walk up to our library and come right. in, you know, drive in the parking lot and walk. In. Sure, sure, sure. So not only not only does it have to address things like parking, but that, that pedestrian. And that, that's important in terms of entry, but then also how the facade feels, you know, as you walk along the facade. You might like to add something to the yeah. town at the bottom there, you know, where's the spirit of the place? And right. there's, there's two parts to that. Part of it is building responding to the spirit of the community, but we're also creating spirit. And to the comment about forward looking, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's both. It's not just responsive, it's like what's great we want right. to create. Right. Good. Yes, sir. Um, speaking of forward looking and where we are theoretically going, and, uh, we can. Something in terms of renewable or passive energy. And you brought it up, I wonder about the possibility of a roof garden, a roof reading space, a roof being space for outdoors, uh, which would save some of the green space. You wouldn't mm -hmm. be having a patio on the ground. Your patio, outdoor patio, for summer use might be on the roof, which saves more green space on the land right. itself. Very nice. So I can extrapolate your statement a little bit is, is creatively maintaining green space on the site. Whether yeah. that's on the roof or some other way, yeah. but for today, we may talk next time about, or in the future, about roof. But I think the key point I'm pulling out of your statement is maintaining green of yes. service. maintaining green space and also okay. uh, as much uh, renewable energy as possible, solar, uh, insulation, um, Picking up on that, which I agree with a lot, um, I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for, but my thought is that a library can be kind of a hub for a community. Mm -hmm. okay. And I couldn't think of anything nicer than to have a lot of people attracted to a library yes. as a meeting or a hangout, or right. if our kids would only hang out in the library, <laughs> it would be so cool. So I mean, I would like to be make it attractive yeah. for a community as a hangout with them. Yeah, yeah. and you, you'll see in the, the next section here, I'm going to talk a little bit about current, you know, current thinking in, in libraries and what's going on, and that is definitely a consideration. Yeah. Yes. And to follow up on that, um, you know, Geneva is now not, at least, it's not now very racially or ethnically diverse, mm -hmm. but it is diverse in terms of uh, family structure. And so uh, some of the population is aging, and uh, there are also young families. Um, and all of the young people we know are kids' friends in Chicago like aspire to Geneva. I mean, these are people in their late <clears throat> 20s and early 30s, and they just think Geneva is the hippest place. Who'd have thought place. we were cool? <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, you know, so we have these really different kind of demographic groups. So in terms of being welcoming and being a community, right. and I, I do think that within this space, that is something that the, the library staff has really done well, I mean, uh, the children's section, uh, you know, kids feel welcome here, sure. young families feel welcome here. They've done a lot with teens and young people, and I think they have some really great programs for the elderly. Right. And so it would be really nice to see that facilitated by the space and the design. Yeah, so. and that, that age group, the late 20s, 30s, yeah. 
have always been hard to get into the library yeah. because they don't, you know, they're they're off doing other things until they have kids. They, yes. they sort of don't come right. back to the library. So I, I understand, but yeah, it would be great to have programs with something going so on. I'm, I'm going to note generational diversity yes. just as a good way of doing it. Yeah. Um, do you think that's also a consideration as an ongoing thing? That, you know, it's not my kids, it's my kids' kids as well, yeah. that it needs to be approachable for that and oh, yeah. flexible for that as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I'm actually, I, I certainly, there are people in Geneva who know the projections for the uh, population here in the age groups, and, and I don't really know what that is. Mm -hmm. But, but right, the generational diversity. Mm -hmm. Could you describe that as kind of a town square, or yeah. the town green yeah. kind of thing, yeah. the feeling? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Going back to this whole idea of community, I know this is for a later discussion, but the idea of maker spaces. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, it's already part of the, yeah. the planning. But that's going to be very important. Mm -hmm. When uh, the roof gardening is touched on, when I saw it on the screen with the UCA, but it went through my head was, I mean, I never thought of a roof garden, but the thought that went through my mind was, it would give a sense of security to the outdoor space. It, to me, new people in town who haven't, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at how insecure they feel about being outside. And I mean, it's like the school bus stops in front of the house in September, and you go, where were those kids this summer? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of it is security issues. Uh -huh. You know, my sister's from another suburb, and she goes, aren't you scared to go to Island Park? No, not yeah. really. Yeah, no, yeah. And so what struck me about the roof garden or a courtyard would do the same, an exterior space where there's a sense of security. Okay. We use that, it's the term we use in kind of architecture, particularly as it relates to schools, is safe and secure. So. Repeat, please. Uh, we kind of use the term safe and secure. Thank you. Yeah. Just one other thought was good. Can I come back? I think this gentleman had a question. Yeah. Well, or a statement. One of the things you talked about was this is not a building for the next 10 or 20 years. This is 100 years. Right. And one of the things that struck me is I read an article recently talking about how we will, analysts are believing that we will not be a, a car-driven society 20 years from now because of automated vehicles, electric cars, et cetera. Um, the plans, you know, the initial renderings I saw was large parking areas for the library, because I know people have complained about that for this library for a long time. Um, and we obviously need parking to begin with. But would it make sense to design something where those parking areas later on can be converted to something else? So, and, and, and not if, only if you own it. If it's just delivering you to the library, Okay. And so, on that thought, if something's going to be delivering us, we need ways of easily having people move in and out. Mm -hmm. right. And then what that offers the opportunity for, if you're not providing as many spaces, is either more green space or more building, and then in the future that's necessary. And so, yeah, that might be a, a benefit down the road. But at this point, we have to, you know, they'll have to plan for that. But from a future point of view, so there's Uber, Tesla, all those that are planning for the nobody owns a car. Somebody just calls them, they show up, they take them wherever, then that car goes and gets the next person. That's kind of your thought yeah, process yeah. of what you've been reading into. And so why, so why, why, why have a parking fun? space for a car just to sit there if it's if you just use like a globalized kind of uh, mass transportation on an individual level? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the follow up on that same thought is, you know, what, what are libraries going to look like 50 years from now? Are there any, are there any books in there? You know, what's, what's that space going to look like? Should we plan for that kind of space, what it could look like? Well, it's interesting, you know, when I first started working on, you know, on the libraries, that was a big question. What do we need them for? We, you know, everything's on the computer. Well, what we found is that the, the library is providing a new series of services and doing new things for, for, for people. So I guess I, I don't have any doubt in my mind 
that, that it will transform. Now, can I say what that would be? Not really. But what we can do is talk to the architect about designing something that's flexible enough to accommodate those future um, needs and, and as, as things change. Yeah. Absolutely. Michael, this lady so, in the dark green had okay, a question. Yes, here. yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I like that idea, too, of, of not having permanent. Uh, this, uh, this would be a more organic. Yes. It, and I, you talk about children bringing uh, adults to communities like Geneva. I, I'd like to have, uh, we, and we talk about spaces outside the library, I'd like to see atriums inside the library and glass and open and bringing our children out of the basement upstairs. <laughs> 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 we we value that our children yeah. in there. Yeah. I just picture a space that, that is open and flexible and where you can take a book and a cup of coffee and go outside. Right. Inside. Okay. And not I feel like you're outside. A lot of outside. a lot of these nice little spaces designed for people outside the library aren't really used. Right. But I think it's just a kind of a clever way of bringing it, putting it outside inside. Okay. Good did you guess that, Fred? Outside, inside. Outside, 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 inside. atrium space, kids out of basement, and outside, inside. Outside, inside. Bring okay. outside, inside. Okay. The only thing I want to say is the discussion of books, because I happen to have a daughter who lives in England and does a lot of research in classics. You know, Oxford doesn't chuck their books. <coughs> They've got warehouses full of books, right. and people still go back to go to those ancient books. So mm -hmm. every day, people may be coming in in a different way in the future, but I would hate to a uh, us think of well, away with books the collection because of, yeah. Yeah. other uh, parts of the world that is not the case. Yeah, and that's, I don't think that's that's ever been the intent. I mean, there are bookless libraries now, but I don't think that's no. you're going that way. Maybe is anybody else over here who hasn't had a chance to answer questions? Because I think I'd like to get maybe one more in and then move to the next segment because we'll have a, we have another point at the end of it to have another discussion as well. So, okay. Where the children are, there's a little park on the property, mm -hmm. and that is most times full of children. Okay. That is the park. Good point. And they love it. They go there. They Neighborhood park. and right. Yeah. It's not large, but they're having a great time, and I think keeping that and incorporating it somewhere on the property, keeping it there, right. would be um, safely away from the cars, but... Um, right. Uh, in an adult park, too. Oh, <laughs> <that would be. laughs> yes. Those swings. <laughs> okay, now if everybody's ready, we're going to get the... Um, okay, the history of libraries in... <laughs> so I, I'm just going to touch upon a few points about libraries um, because you can't really uh, give you a whole history. But you know, the, if you look back in time, probably one of the most famous libraries was the Library of Alexandria. Um, and at that time, you know, pe people were acquiring, you know, basically scrolls, um, and they, you know, the, the idea was to create a place where scholars could go and, and, and read and study and basically a repository for knowledge. Um, we, we know that uh, um, paper burns and uh, I think they had a number of different fires at Alexandria and uh, um, the, the, the library did burn. At this time too, to show you how important collections were, you would have um, people, you know, invading cities and basically stealing their their library, taking it and bringing it to their library. So the value of, of the materials was always very high. In medieval times, you had basically, you know, precious, book books were still precious objects, and you had the chained library, 
you can see in these images here, where these are all the chains that connect to the book, so nobody could take it really anywhere. You sat down right next to the right next to the bookcase and you read. Um, here you see the, see the book associated with some natural light, but uh, still you have this, you know, being used by scholars, not just the every everyday person. Um, and again, you know, most people were, were still illiterate at this point in time. So now we're going to go way, uh, we're going to jump to America. And we're going to talk a little bit about Ben Franklin, who established really what was called the first lending library in America in 1731. I, I, it was a lending library, but he, he, he established this library with, with friends so that they could buy, they could pool their money and buy materials. And basically, you know, Franklin had a great love for learning and uh, we, we still see the high cost of print material and this was a way to uh, defray the cost to, to, to other people as well. Eventually, that, that did become uh, a collection open to the public, but much, much later on. Um, and then in the late 1700s, we see more immigration to America. We see a whole philosophy of free education starting in New England and then in, in, in the United States. And by 1833, so basically 100 years later, the first uh, free library, a public uh, library, is opened in, in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Now, this Anybody know what this is? So, Franklin was also a great inventor, and he invented a library chair that could transform into a step stool for reaching, for reaching the higher shelves. A transformer. And here's another, another uh, Franklin library invention. Does there, anybody know what that is? It, it, it's not to corral kids. <laughs> it is. It is the forerunner of the grabber. <laughs> so he had a couple of pieces of wood put together. That's right. And you pull it and it grab the book. Fun facts. The next person we want I want to talk about is uh, Henry Hobson Richardson, who was an architect in, in Boston, basically, famous for designing the uh, Trinity Church in downtown Boston, which is still there. And uh, actually designed a number of buildings in the Marshall Field Warehouse, I think that was torn down, and the, uh, the Lesnar House, which is still uh, in, in the Chicago area. But he, he's important because he really set the standard for suburban libraries in the United States. He established a basic plan, configuration, entry, stair tower, meeting room, stacks, and I think you can begin to see those defined spaces in the plan, pretty obvious. He also apparently liked to dress as a monk. <laughs> uh, I asked Craig if he would get, I would get it all, so. <laughs> So um, here's one of his libraries. This is a library, Wood Memorial in, in Hoover, Mass., which is um, west of, of, of Boston. Um, but you can begin to see that his architecture now, he's designing in the late 1700s, looks back to Romanesque. And uh, actually, his architecture is called, his work is called Richardsonian Romanesque, um, basically a style named after him. He championed this style. Um, and you see the. Uh, you can see this direct relationship between the parts. So you have a part out here, it corresponds here. You have the tower here, reading area here, and the stack area at the very end. Here's the, here's the stack. Not a very good slide, I apologize. But um, very distinct parts of the building. This idea of the relationship between the form and the, and the function that is happening behind it. So. Unfortunately, at the same time that Richardson was working, you see the rise of the library profession uh, happening. Um, and they were beginning to clash with the architects because the buildings, I'm sorry, no, no, am I in your way? No, no. Okay, uh, because the buildings were, were, were not functioning for them. But in those days, the architect did whatever they wanted and they said, this is it and this is good and you, you're, you're gonna take it. But the American Library Association came out to and condemned his buildings as unsuitable for library work. 
So they may look good, but they were unsuitable. So we go back to our sort of <coughs> triangle here, and we find out that, yeah, it may have looked interesting, but it, it didn't work for people. And even at the time, you know, he was very popular, but people came out and said this building is anti-modern, it's poorly lit, you know, you can't, uh, the staff can't, you know, find people, and it, it, it's nooks and crannies and those sorts of things. And so, um, but when I went to architecture school, these libraries were still being studied as the ideal in library design, which is problematic <laughs> because people kept repeating it, repeating it. Next person, I don't know if you can talk about Andrew Carnegie. He actually uh, donated some money to, to the completion of this library here. Um, you can begin to see his impact on libraries in America. He contributed money to 2,500 libraries between 1883 and 1929. This is really a profound effect upon libraries in America. Almost 1,700 in the U.S. And you can see that Illinois was a, a, a healthy recipient of those, of those libraries. And if you drive through a lot of the small towns in Illinois, you'll come upon a building that almost looks out of place and it's the Carnegie Library because it is the most prominent building in, in, in the town. Was he involved in design? No. He just wrote the check. Yeah. <laughs> but he had, well, he had, and he had people who were doing the administration and that sort of thing. But it was his, it was his philanthropic nature. Well, he built a bunch of, eventually in Europe and Scotland. I mean, it wasn't just the United States. They did have, just a, they did end up having a lot of common things. Like, in the basements, <laughs> level design, you know, they, they kind of developed because I think Bob researched about the fireplace and yeah. at some point they got to the point where they were becoming a little bit more involved in the process of like, okay, it's my money so I'm going to weigh in on a few things, <laughs> like getting rid of fireplaces in Carnegie Building. Yeah, it was about 1909-1910 that the Carnegie Foundation wanted, had to review the plans before they would give money to the libraries. So they right. did. They weren't happy with some of the libraries that were being built. So they right. did start to take a little bit of an active role in the design well, of the school. And if you're going to approve plans and you want to get money, what do you do? You start making all the plans look the same, so they yeah. approved. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the, the, the old Carnegie still have all the documentation and that sort of thing, all the handwritten letters about their application. And so, um, as we said, as I said here, you can see that this is uh, this is Mount Vernon Library. You know. Uh, years ago. Basically, you know, a lot of them have this look, timber interior, um, and a great quote by Carnegie Library, outranks any other one thing a community can do to benefit its people. It's a never failing spring in the desert. So here we are a hundred years later, basically. The, the, we had the Carnegie explosion, and we're trying to say, do they, how do they function as a library? Well, Craig just, just mentioned how the entry is split, and so you have this problem as you come in the building, you either have to go up or you have to go down. Um, problem in terms of ADA, any kind of renovation, you have to provide uh, access, typically that means a, uh, an elevator or ramps in and out of the building. Um, but what they also have, and you know, it's part, part and parcel of the day, you know, these sort of small rooms that <coughs> are sort of uh, don't work this, in the way that the current library will work, does work. It, it really sort of chopped up into these smaller spaces. And then you have a structure which is a wood frame, so it no longer meets the loading requirements of a, of a, a current library. So we, you know, in the past I, I actually uh, worked on a renovation of one and we sort of preserved it as a little gem and then you have to do really the library uh, attached to it. And th there are some problems with that too, I mean, in terms of codes, and, but they served for a long, I mean, a hundred years. Or so. so where are we now? And I don't know, Pew Research uh, Center continually does things about libraries um, in, in terms of getting opinions. And I think the two things here that, that, that I really like are the 94% the said having a public library improves the quality of life in the community. 
you can, I, I don't know what else you can get 94% of the people who agree. <laughs> I think that's pretty profound. Yeah. The other thing, the other statistic is 90% said that closing the local library would have an impact on the community. And, and you know, we certainly know that. But interestingly, only 67% of the people said that it would have an impact on them personally. So what that means is that this, the library is, is, is viewed as a community resource. Not only for me, who you know, may not use it, but for other people in, in the community. It's really, it's, it's really pretty cool. So how have things changed? We have this change of service. We talked about the libraries being focused on collections, even in Alexandria and uh, uh, through the Middle Ages and Carnegie. Uh, but really what's happened now is we've moved from collection focus to patron focus. So the, the green, everybody gets it probably, represent people. These are the stacks. Um, we see this happening uh, more and more. So the collections also, what's happening with collections, some collections are shrinking, going away. Um, We've seen in uh, lots of libraries where the reference collection is minimal at this point because all of the information is available online. So, but what we also we also see is a lot more socialization in the library, people getting together. When I was working on uh, the, the library up at Elgin Community College, one of the, the sort of dictums or the, the, the dictates was that you want to make a place where learning can happen anywhere. And so it's not only learning you know, a professor and a, and a student, but it's, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. And I think that that's a really important lesson to be aware of in, in, in terms of the community library. So we also, we also see more collaboration between people and then, of course, having, having the types of uh, furniture um, that, that will accommodate that. Maker spaces or, or content creation where people are doing green room. Films, people are recording music, the whole series of things that people are doing now. Um, we've got uh, increase in meeting spaces, both in terms of uh, large meeting spaces and small meeting spaces for study rooms. Um, and then technology, of course, we, we can't pass that up. And technology is on both levels. It's not only for the, for the patron, but also for the staff as well. And so we see this is a sorter that uh, really sort of uh, really cuts down on the number of times the books have to be handled and get back on the shelves quicker. And then we also see things like media boxes or different ways of housing the materials. And we'll con probably continue to see change in that as those, those materials change as well. So what does it look like? You know, we go from these, these kind of spaces of shelving, 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 to more open areas, and then areas that where the shelving sort of encloses another kind of activity, um, and it just is a much more gentle approach um, to design. Also engaging the senses, libraries used to be sort of the, you know, white walls and, and very quiet uh, places, um, but we see a, you know, a sort of exuberance of, of energy in a lot of a lot of libraries, this is a children's children's area over in here with a hanging sculpture. But we also see more tactile things. We know that there's more sound. People talk on their phones, and also in a lot of places, people are eating. Um, so you have smells and, and, and tastes, uh, things that were formerly restricted from the library. <laughs> Furniture options have exploded as well. It used to, uh, people probably know, you used to go to the library, you got a wooden chair and a table, and you sat at the table, and maybe there'd be a couch, you know, you, you could sit on. But that has really changed. And, you know, talking about creating environments with the furniture as well. And so you have this, you know, idea that you're, you're semi-private, you can get away, you can feel like you're having a private conversation, but yet you can still have access and people can still see you. Um, I talked a little bit before about collaboration, but then, you know, color um, and then um, uh, activities that might center around a console um, for kids and those, those sorts of things as well. Color, and then, you know, you have the, the variety of shapes, sizes, and ways that people occupy the furniture <coughs> that has to be taken into account. So we're talking about strong furniture, but a variety of furniture. 
And so I did a little look back. And this, this sort of refers to the question you asked about, you know, where are we in 100 years or sort of where, where are we going? So I took a little look and looked at communication. And I saw the old, the old telephone here and, you know, the ubiquitous uh, smartphone. So we look at the model, the model T in 1918, and I think it's Ford Fusion, probably a hybrid here. We look at society and culture. You know, we see a couple here. Remember that uh, 1918 was still during the war. The war was the first world war, wasn't over yet, and it was still two years before women would have the vote in America. And so, um, 100, a little over 100 million people. Um, so when I look when I look through these things, I see basically we, we seem to be moving from single use to multifunction. So the phone is no longer just the phone, it's a camera, it, you can do your you can send emails on it, you can do all sorts of things. Whereas, you know, up here, you really did that one thing and that was it. The candles, the phone. You know, even even the cars, I mean here you know some of them have better stereo systems than my living room. And, you know, lots of accommodations in cars these days. Um, and, and the changes in society, you know, I think we live in a much more casual society than in the past. This is a little bit, bit more formal where, you know, people have probably had certain clothing that they went out on Sunday in or they went to eat in, um, whereas now you basically you're pretty casual and you can do whatever you want in your casual clothes. And so in terms of public library planning, I think you saw some of the earlier uh, images of the Carnegie <coughs> buildings where you have these areas relegated to, to stacks and pretty, pretty organized around the function, a single function. Um, in the new planning model, um, what becomes, it becomes much more flexible. So we move from this compartmentalization of different uh, activities to a, a, a sort of free-flowing, intermingling of collections, people, activities, and that sort of thing. And so this, you know, getting back to somebody's comment about uh, more space and open space, it really is the, the sort of new model in, in libraries. And so with that, Rick McCarthy from Studio GC is going to talk a little bit about some contemporary libraries. Thank you, Michael. Exciting to be here tonight. Glad everybody could come. So, which one advances it, Michael? All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to figure that eventually. I oh, I have a problem. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I think, you know, to Michael's one of the most recent themes he said there is about how one object is doing more than one thing now, like the, how the phones have changed it. And we're seeing exactly that happening in libraries. And one of the things we wanted to talk about tonight was the community's aspirations for what the library is going to do. So I thought, well, let's see what some other people did and what they aspired to for their community, just because it might give us some ideas on something, some things to talk about. So just like think four libraries went back and did a little research and found what was important to those people in those libraries. Now, these are all contemporary libraries, and they look like contemporary libraries. We're not talking about design now, so don't sweat the images you're going to see. This is just, we're talking about what the aspirations are at this point, what it does and what it means, and not what it looks like. That's going to happen in the future, in a, in a future one. So anyway, I looked at several libraries, and what I was kind of surprised by a couple of things. I was kind of surprised, one thing was, how many of the aspirations tended to overlap between one community and the next? You know, we all think we're absolutely special, we're all different, but it was interesting to find out how, how much commonality there was. So we'll just look at a couple of them here and uh, talk about what was important to those clients and what they did. This is the uh, Salem Beach Library in Salem Beach, Washington. And um, <coughs> I looked at some of the things that they talked about there and what they thought was, what they thought was important. And, Number, one of the highest things on our list was how can we have a building that has a lot of natural light in it, especially if you're in Washington State. Yeah. You know, every every photon <laughs> means something in Washington State. So that was, that was a that big something. And they talked about, you know, how can a library advertise itself as what might be happening on the inside. They thought that was important. 
they, they, this is right next to a civic plaza, and they thought, how can we make it the strongest connection with a civic plaza? Now, we're going to be next to a neighborhood, we're going to be next to partially a parking lot until cars go away, and next to a park. So I think some of the questions that we want to talk about are how can we increase the, 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 the connection there? And um, one thing that doesn't show up in this picture is that they were really interested in how, other, how they could do other things on the site. Behind the library there is a reflexology path, where you go and whatever you do for reflexology. Michael, what do you do for reflexology? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Anyway, whatever it, is, whatever it is, there's a path for it behind the building. They have a lawn for events and an exterior gathering point for community things to happen, all, all things that I think are great or are more important to them. And they wanted it to be a civic anchor, and they made to, real decisions there to make it look like a civic building, give it that kind of, that kind of civic presence. So that's what, that's what was important to them. We look at West Berkeley Public Library, Berkeley, California. You know, they had a wide section of concerns. Some of them were kind of prosaic, like, how do we get something that's going to last a long time and that doesn't take a lot of maintenance? And so they used a, a product that we've been using a lot of, trash panels on the outside, which are Higher first cost, but they last a really long time. And so that was a successful thing for them to do there. They also wanted to create stronger connections with the site around it. And there's a street right in front of it. So one of the things they did there is they pulled the canopy out to give people protection from sun and rain and make the library a building that does more than just one thing. And I think if there's a theme we see with some of these, one of the differences is, like when you look at a lot of the pictures that Michael showed there of historic libraries, a lot of them, if you look at old ones, they, they were kind of sculptural elements within, within a, a town. And now one of the things we've been exploring is how are, how are different ways can build, these buildings relate? And so if, instead of being in a community, how do we make it of the community and look at other things that can happen? And that was one of the things that they wanted to do. This energy efficiency was really important to them. I mean, some bills I remembered what some of them were. And this is a zero net energy library. Photovoltaic panels on the roof, natural ventilation. I mean, a lot of things happening there to make that zero net energy happen. And that, you know, to them, that was really an important thing. You have to make compromises to make something like that work, but if it's important enough, that's one of the things we might want to look at. You know, how, how sustainable is it going to be? That has also paths around it, but you don't see them in the picture here, for uh, uh, basically environmental education paths that surround the library so that let children learn things about the environment as they, as they go on, which I thought was pretty, pretty neat. And it's all passive design strategies. 90% of the build, this building is lit by natural light without any artificial light on, on a reasonably bright day. So and apparently they really wanted people to know that this was the library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you know, yeah, well, that's a, you know, and, and it's funny because there's a bigger question there because, you know, when you're talking about how a library relates to the community, like I said, we're not about designed here right now yet, but if you real, you know, you want to show that it's a library. I mean, what if they built a library and nobody noticed? You know, I mean, we, you know, it's like, how do we respect the community yet have a building that, 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 you know, means something? So, yeah, then that's, they, yeah, they made a decision there. Let's not let anybody confuse us, confuse us with something else. Do you give them a little bit of credit? At least they didn't name it a community learning resource center. Well, yeah, I have a, they probably paid by the letter there, so I think they probably did. So, uh, Paris Bourbon uh, County Library in Paris, Kentucky. Again, the same thing, how do we maximize the amount of natural light in, the, in there? This is an agricultural area, and so they wanted to get, use a lot of local materials in there to kind of tie it back. So, like, for the, some of the discussions here, a lot of local stone. And this is a really good example, I think, of how, you know, without using a particular style, you can tie a building to the community with materials and proportions and things without pretending that you're something that, that you're not. So I thought that was nice there. They also thought that the concept of you know, showing, using glazing to show what happens in the building is a good thing. And you can see that on the bottom picture. And I thought it was a very uh, uh, strong expression there. Even things in here, they used recycled barn wood and such. And now the interesting thing is here, this is actually an addition. To, and they made a conscious decision 
you know, it's Carnegie Library there. And they made a conscious decision, we're not going to try to replicate exactly what's in that Carnegie Library. Because all, like Michael was saying, with the stairs, the stuff, there's just a lot of prob problems, current problems with it trying to be like a Carnegie Library. So they said, let's take materials that have some of the same color palettes, some of the same materials there, and just connect it to it and let it be a 21st century edition. So a decision to make it and how it relates to it, but that was one of their aspirations for that, for that project. Ballard Branch Library in Seattle, Washington. One of my favorite libraries, actually. One of the big things there, one maybe the biggest, what of sustainability again? It was the number one on the list. So this is all the green roof on top here, on this big curving, um, curving roof. In the area there, there's a lot of local rolling hills and valleys and such, and so they made the roof deck actually kind of look like one of those. Used local sourced uh, timber for it, for the, the, the cut down in the forest or in, in that area, and did a lot of things to tie it to the area and to be as sustainable as possible. And that same theme again about how do we show what's happening in the library with all the glazing there. One of the big differences between buildings now and what Michael was showing on the older pictures is high performance glazing that didn't exist before and the ability of the structure that like Michael was showing, the ability to have big pieces of glass without walls separating them everywhere made a tremendous difference in how we can design libraries and how we can control light coming into it. But a really, a really interesting building, you know, great materials, the wood and they had the, the meeting room they pulled out with zinc panels just to give it a little bit of sparkle and make something that, that, that would show up there. And the large overhangs so are going to have natural light without a lot of sun uh, heat gain at the same time. A really fun, a really fun and nice, and nice building there. And uh, closer to home, Addison Public Library. Um, Mike and I did this one. Um, this Addison Library is right next to the Civic. What do they call the City Hall? The city hall, and right in front of the new site is where everybody goes to pay their traffic tickets and such. So they're kind of cranky when they get there. But we wanted to do the same thing here of showing people as they went in what was happening within the library and letting that help. That was important to the client. How do we connect this with, with the community? And together as a group, we made a decision. The, the city hall next to it and such is kind of a faux neoclassical building. Yeah, of, of no no. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. And so I think city council expected us to replicate that and have another faux neoclassical building with columns up in front. And we talked to the board about it and said, we, we think we need to make our own statement. And it has been well received and people love it. And, and Michael had a great idea at the back of this building. There's a two story atrium, which looked a little like this, but with more glass. And there, you saw a picture of it, where they had sculptures hanging in it and, and such. And as you drive by at nighttime, it's just this like feast of colors and fun images as you as you go by. And so, as far as the community aspiration there, that was important. So we've seen different ways to connect the library to the community. You know, visual, um, local materials. We've seen people really asking for strong uh, sustainability. Uh, aspects of that, and so those are some of, those are some of the, the big things. And I think as we move on here, thinking about your aspirations for what you want your library, not necessarily to look like, like yet, but you know what what you wanted to do and how you, in general sense, how you wanted to feel, and that will start to inform us on the next phase of the project here. So. And that, that actually is a perfect lead-in. I think that you know the excitement that some of these images generate um, is, is, is perfect. Because what we want to do now, and Craig is going to be taking down text. Yeah. We want to ask everybody, so what are your aspirations for Geneva and the library? So you can see this in two different ways, maybe. Maybe you want to think to yourself how you would complete this sentence. I want to live in a community that is, and then, or I want a library that is like. And I've, sometimes people need a little stimulus. I don't think you, you really do. But, you know, there, there's lots of different ways you can, you can say it. None of these, you can say the opposite of these. I just put a few things up there 
um, that people might re either respond to, or you know, just tell us how you think. You're very humble, Michael. What? Very humble. Is there something? Well, you know, I, I, no judgment. I want to live in a community that's well educated. Well educated. Okay. Forward thinking, great. I want to live in a community that's open. Open. Uh, define open a bit more so I can welcome. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Stimulates creativity. Stimulates creativity. Like that. Yeah. I want a library that that is as accessible to everyone as possible. Okay. Collectivist. So, like, American culture is viewed as like an individualist culture. So, collectivist is like a whole people coming together, okay. community mm -hmm. issue. Okay. Yeah. okay. It's sort of the obvious, but it seems to be diminishing throughout the presentation tonight. I want a library that has books in it. Books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's. Okay. Currently, it's taken for granted. Maybe sure. a month from now, it won't be. Mm -hmm. I go to the shelf. I take down a book. I see it was published in '87. I see it's been checked by a librarian ten times mm -hmm. in those years. I know that that was written in '87. Mm -hmm. You go to a computer. Are you sure what you're reading today? was written when it says it was written, or was it altered electronically half an hour ago? I miss the Is that an aspiration? Do you want to make card catalogs in all catalogs? I promise you'll have at least 25 books. I think they will be all set. I think somebody said it earlier, but like pedestrian friendly. OK. Yeah. I think the idea of very accessible, you know, runs a real sort of gamut of things. Flexible for right. now and for a hundred years. Flexibility. <laughs> that it can right. become whatever it needs to become. Adapt. Right. Adaptable. It's basically uh -huh. Sorry, old guy, I keep turning my back. I want something that we can be proud of. Proud of. Right. Pride. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'd like to see a place that exudes culture, exudes including culture. the arts, knowledge, and be a fun place to learn. Great. Wow, that's great. Yes. Anybody I know there's people who haven't said anything, so <laughs> before I start calling on people. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I'd like the library to be a fun place to go, like I don't want to they had, um, like on the grounds of uh, where you work, they had uh, like life size chess boards that kids could play with, or a scrabble board. Uh -huh. You know, kind of fun. Uh -huh. Okay. Fun, educational, life size. Mm -hmm. Can I get another one? Sure. sure. Stimulating. Stimulating. Yeah. Okay. I suck at that one. <laughs> right, I'll put it times two next time. <laughs> <laughs> a statement of wow, the same thing. Wow. Yeah. Right. When you walk Is that same thing as stimulating, or you say that as something different? Well, that's different. You're right. Oh, like, wow. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. I you know what wow. Should be efficient, too. Efficient? Yeah, efficient. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. sustainable. Operationally or energy? Yes. The, okay. What about the whole point? <laughs> Showcasing renewable energy, you know, I guess the, the, the library supporting itself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all have to step on the treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> Bicycle. That's how you get to check out a book. <laughs> 20 minutes on the treadmill. And you get yeah. I, I'd like a library that showcases the history of the town. Uh -huh. So we're new to this town. We've been here for five years. and. We hear about the history all the time, and I think the most we've really seen of that is we go to the historical museum, you know, at the Christmas walk and walk through the Christmas trees, and 
when I have to get permits, I go in and while I'm waiting, I'll turn around and look at the little glass case that's that's there. But aside from that, really not a whole lot that can be in your face that says, here's why people love this town so much. Then you should go to the museum more often. Well, we should. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if, it was, if it was part of our, our weekly or daily or you know monthly circuit that we do in the town, we probably would. So if it's, if it's part of the library, I guarantee you we 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 look at it. So you you may not want to be speaking just about like a building form, but maybe about a program or a portion or exhibits or something along that lines as well. I mean, maybe in the yeah. building too, to a certain extent. Yeah. But okay. I think you're mixing things up. Yeah. Big time. It's president of the board of the History Museum. <laughs> Full disclosure. I think that that's where the history is, um, and I think that that's what people should be aware of, that there are exhibits constantly changing, and there's special exhibits for children and everything else, one starting right now for the whole summer. Um, and I see that that's where it, the history is, yes, we have books about the Geneva history, which mm -hmm. should obviously, and some are in the library, right. but I don't think you want to mix those no. two things in that way. So I wrote down, don't dilute history museum or his other historical resources. Right. Right. Okay. We do enjoy coming here to here. Uh, we met Lincoln, we met Grant, we met, uh, you know, all these other, other uh, people who were part of the history. I was, I was going to say you're older than your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's, that's what we enjoy. That kind of a big venue for things like that. Yeah, so yeah. a venue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Somebody's a living museum. Yes, yes sir. So think about what? I would argue that you can still incorporate part of the history into it without having to done the museum. So like we saw in the slideshow when they did the addition to the Carnegie library, how they still reflected on the same materials that was in the old um, library itself. So it was still kind of incorporating that past history while still showing the modern times and changing and being adaptable. So I'm going to write from showing history by change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a question more. Currently, are there seasons that the library's more utilized than other times? Very much so. Summer has 55% higher use than winter months in the library. I always found it surprising because you think everybody's outside, school's out, but it's school's out so everybody can come <laughs> to the library. That's why there's a lot of renovation work at libraries, like when we did upstairs. It happens kind of right after school's out, but right before kind of winter <coughs> So should we be designing a library for that? Okay, to accommodate kind of to, to accommodate or to offset that kind of swing, is that what you're saying? Or accommodate that swing. <laughs> okay. Or to draw more people in, in the off season. Why why is it an off season? Is it something about the design or the functionality of it? Or or is responsive to what the community needs at that time? than others so if kids are in school what is it going to be better during the school hours that keeps it from being just so kid oriented per se like um, as an example a, a, a business center or something like that for entrepreneurs yes building off that Batavia does a monthly book sale and as part of that they have a dedicated room for the book sale so the shelves are being stocked by volunteers or upgraded all the time but we can all put that on our calendars 12 times a year there's a reason for me to drive down to Batavia I don't okay. go to the library otherwise but I go for the book sale okay so we could do that more than twice a year and more than opening the cabinets and setting up folding tables but having something permanent or semi-permanent Another, yeah. no, I'm just thinking of you know what the draw of, of libraries and incorporating cafes or some other spaces that are a draw that will like more community type more spaces. Community type spaces. Social, 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 social. Yeah. 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 
cafes, restaurants, you know, whatever it might be, to make that a central point. Yeah, like a library that can host events, like lectures or small concerts. Right. Okay. Yeah, we, we've seen that through, throughout the process. Library design in terms of meeting space and meeting large meeting space. And a series of types of spaces. A good school to help. In order to play devil's advocate on the um, food and beverage, I know that you know Geneva is very small business oriented, and the library would be a taxpayer's money, so you don't want it to be profitable when you speak to the food and beverage. So I don't know if there's an opportunity to partner with the local coffee company to have them have their things, because I know that, that that has been issues in other communities. Yeah, it, it's always been a quirky thing. You know, when coffee culture sort of hit us, you know, everybody started wanting to have a, 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 a cafe, and then all of a sudden, you know, they had to work out a deal with a vendor, and it became yeah. it kind of messy. So. It, You'd rather it, people a, go to Graham's and walk down. Right, so we've been calling them cafe-like spaces. Yeah. yeah. Because the intent is to, um, when we've talked about it in the past, is to kind of recreate that feeling, that vibrancy of space. So. Yes, I want a library with emphasis on lectures, a lot of lectures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Education. Education. Yeah. I mean, and that comes down to a venue that's going to support those kind of things. Yeah. And programming. Yes, I want a library with librarians that I can talk with. <laughs> okay. Okay. Libraries I can talk with. Right. So people are important. Are still important. We, we know that. Yeah. Did anybody mention community groups that want to have meetings? You know, small groups sure. that belong to two or three groups that meet right. all of the time, and uh, we are always struggling for a place to meet. Okay. Small group meetings, small community meetings. Okay. Okay. They have a room that they fill frequently, and they hold a hundred people. Right. I mentioned tithe. We haven't mentioned tithe yet. Tithe. I, I think it's important for I get into a building that it's clean and in order. And um, <laughs> looking at the various, uh, you know, floor coverings or flooring, I think it's important. Yeah. It, so it, something that would be easy to put. And, and it's a good it's thing you, you, you. It's a good thing you don't get into the staff offices <laughs> because. Typically in libraries, there is stuff all over the place because they work with books and moving stuff around. And yeah, no. So, but tidy in the public, public space. So that also, to a certain extent, if I'm going to extrapolate, also means good lighting, Where? that sort of thing as well. Crispness, clarity. There has to be a balance between the emphasis of being a community center with lots of activities and things going on. And what many people want in the library is some quiet and an area to study or read. Yes. And do um, and both, but they've got to be the right balance. Right. It so, used to be that uh, the whole library was a quiet place. Yes. Now, now, now we're really working more, more often on having library. quiet rooms that were, they really are quiet. Please finish your project. The collector of noise for checkout at this time. So a, a balance between quiet and active spaces, I think so. Yeah. And, and there would be times the whole library is filled with activities, and other times not. So right? it all depends on the calendar and schedule. And I think it was trying to show before in some of the seating environments, you can really create a quiet, a quiet area, and, and you can do that through time. Yeah. Maybe have. Um, we've been talking about meeting spaces. That meeting spaces that have separate entrances and exits from the main library so that 
but it closes in 15 minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're all out of here in about 10. So. <laughs> Um, a lot of the libraries that we saw up there were kind of either in the city center area or kind of out on an island somewhere. Mm. Do, you, do you see any special considerations that this library is going to be flanked on all four sides by housing? Well, yeah, I think, you know, part of our next talk is going to be uh, much more about the site and about the context. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, those things, and I think I tried to indicate that the, the the situation and the site is of critical importance. Um, and we'll be reviewing that and talking about so that. So I want to kind of note it as an aspiration of is it sensitive to its site, so its context. Understanding, yeah. The Understanding, the context, and, okay. Or, own concept, reading room for people looking for quiet reading space. picture outside. We've got a lot of good stuff on the kind of inside and some of the programs and features, but anything else to kind of close out that somebody felt they wish they had said 10 minutes ago? Yeah. Maybe a connection with the school districts. Okay. Um, talking with them, I don't, you know, they don't have these to provide things after school hours, a need that they have, but I think it's very good making education. I would see that also at the uh, communication between the schools and, and the classroom, the classroom and the library. We have the ability to create a, 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 a how should I say that? If, if there's a library, well, if the kid has a project school, it is published that he's got to do. And they should be able to come here and maybe check to see that we're going to get some uh, assignment that, you know, and, and work on it. So a good kind of school partnership. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have seen that in a lot of the libraries where kids are working more collaboratively and providing those spaces and those tools a lot of times and technology to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's helpful. And that's a hindrance. My own kids have run into that as well. Well, I, Oh, I always got the you know, thing where, when did you assign this? Well, <laughs> six weeks ago. <laughs> oh, you didn't do it yesterday? <laughs> so, um, all right, I'm going to, from our perspective, I've got a lot of good information. So right. I'm going to say from Studio DC, thank you. And Ricky can add to that. I just want to say that um, just about everything we heard here are things that we think are important in library design. Who would have thought they were such a smart person? I know. I <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, though, it's a, it, it, it's a really a good, I think it folds well because it's all things that we're sensitive to, but it's good to hear what is particularly important. Yeah, and I want to thank everybody for being open and willing to share their thoughts because sometimes we have meetings and people don't speak and then they're complaining later on. So this is, this is really great. And the goal is now for the architects to begin to take this information and come up with a more defined way of achieving those goals. And that their, the architecture then has to reflect those goals. And so when we, next time we're going to talk about plans, we're going to talk about the site um, and, and, and uh, some of the established things and some of the things we might want to try and do. And then by the third meeting, they should have elevations and drawings of the building that reflect your ideas. When's the next meeting? Okay, I'll, I'll cover that in just a second. Good transition, thank you. First of all, if you could join me in thanking Michael.
presentation and it allowed you to give us a lot of really great input. This is exactly the type of thing we're looking for. As Michael said, the next steps are to start to translate that into more details. Uh, the next meeting is a week from tonight, June 13th, 7 o'clock, same, same place. I encourage you to come to that session. The third session then is July 19th. I think that's a Wednesday night where we'll start to see some uh, options on elevations and so forth. So if at all possible, I encourage you to come to all three meetings. Uh, you can continue to, to think about these topics. And if you come up with new ideas or new thoughts that uh, you didn't come up with tonight, bring those to the next meeting. We'll capture those and roll that into our thinking also. So again, thank you very much uh, for a great meeting. On behalf of the board, we got exactly, I think, the kind of input we're looking for. And it's going to really help the architects and come up with something that this community is really going to be proud of. So thank you again, and I'll see you next week.